All right. Well, thank you, everyone, um, for joining. Welcome to the Work of Design Live presentation, How to Get Paid for Your Value. Uh, we at Studio Designer launched this webinar series to share design business advice, best practices, and to encourage knowledge sharing within our interior design community. Uh, to deliver the best content, we partner with thought leaders and experts in the industry to share their expertise on running a design firm. So we're thrilled to have Keith Granite and Julia Nikishina here today to talk about how to get paid for your value and wanna thank you all for joining us. Just some quick housekeeping. Here's a look at what we'll cover today. We encourage you to use the chat during today's presentation and to submit questions in the QA channel. Uh, Keith and Julia will address as many questions as they can towards the end of the presentation. We also have Colin Lawrence from our studio designer team here who is going to join us at the end to talk about something exciting we have happening here at Studio Designer. So as mentioned, we have Keith Granite with us today. Keith is a leading expert on the business of design, the founder of Granite and Associates, and CEO of Studio Designer. Keith has played a significant role in the design industry's growth and surging public profile. He's also the author of The Business of Design, Balancing Creativity and Profitability, and The Business of Creativity, Building the Right Team for Success. And we also have Julia Nikishina, a founder of New Age Financial Consulting. Julia provides all levels of accounting support from basic bookkeeping to CFO services for large and small businesses. She and her team specialize in the unique and complex accounting needs of interior design firms and showrooms. All right, so from here, I'll hand things over to Keith and Julia to kick off today's discussion, starting with determining your value. Thank you, Sam. Hi, everybody. Welcome, uh, Julia, nice to have you here with us. Um, our goal, everybody, is for Julia and I to have a conversation about your value and how you charge for fees and how you communicate that value. I, we have found through the years that um, you know, like this comment says, if you, you don't understand the value you bring to your project, how do you expect your clients to pay for it? And the importance of this uh, webinar really is to help you understand, you know, the many ways that people charge, but also how do you communicate it in a way that people want to pay you for your services? Um, there are all if you ask 10 designers, you're going to get 10 different answers of how they charge. And so we're trying to bring that around to you in a way that it becomes clear and that you can communicate uh, how you charge and how it relates to your value. Um, Julia, do you want to add anything as far as um, that sort of comment? Uh, I mean, I would definitely agree with you. I, I think that there's there's so many ways to structure a contract. I'm always um, of the of the belief that you you should try to appease your client to a degree, um, as long as you're still getting paid for for what you're worth. So if somebody doesn't want a, a contract structured in in one way but another way, as long as you're making the amount of money you know you need to make for that type of project, then you're still in the clear. Um, but uh, absolutely, ten different ways to do it. Exactly. And, you know, as, as we bring up the word contract, I just want to tell everybody that it's my firm belief that most of your clients probably have a lot more money than you do. And so if you ever get to a point where you're having to point to your contract um, as a negotiation, it means the relationship is probably not in a great shape or is failing. And that really contracts are meant to sort of determine expectations. You should not use them to point them when somebody when something's going wrong. It should be just setting the expectations of how you charge and you know what they can expect of you and what you should expect from your clients. But if you're looking to it as a contract to protect you, you know, it, yes, that's what it's intended to be, but in truth, it's it's never going to serve you that way because if you ever have, have to go to court, your relationship is falling apart. And so we don't really recommend that you go that far with it. You hopefully it never gets that way, but it's really about building a relationship and communicating along the way. So everyone understands what's expected of each other. Um, I'm sure Julia, you've had that experience where someone's had to pull out their contract and 
and really, you know, just said that, well, these are the terms and you know, the relationship at that point is probably gone. Always similar to a divorce, right? <laughs> exactly. In, in, yeah. in many ways. In many ways. Um, same. I mean, I agree with you. I, I think it's, and you see all the loop, you, you see all the missing pieces, right? When you get to that point of the relationship of, of what your contract didn't cover. Uh, and, and really, if you have a good rapport with the client, um, you, you never need to reference it, right? It's it's never an issue. But I think regardless of how long or how short your contract is, if it gets to that point, there'll always, I think, there'll always be something missing. Yes, for sure. And I, you know, I also want to say that, um, you know, I hear a lot from designers at times that when clients try to negotiate your fees, uh, that if you sort of bend from one client versus another, they all talk to each other at some point. And it just puts you in a position where your value becomes really unknown when, I mean, I used to use this analogy when years ago, if you'd go into like a Best Buy and you'd say, you know, I want that phone and they'd say it's $500. And then you'd say, well, it's, they sell it at, you know, Verizon for 450. I'll give it to you for 450. And suddenly it just loses its value because you don't know whether you always think you're sort of getting screwed if, if they can meet that price right away. And when a client negotiates with you and you bend on your, your pricing, it make, it makes you vulnerable that you're, that you're not actually convinced that that's your value. And what I like to tell people is that when a client says, you know, can you do this for less? It's like, I can't, and I'll tell you why, because if I do it for you, how is that fair to all my other clients who are paying my full rate? And why would you want to put me in a position where you are basically a second-class citizen within my office when I think every time I'm working on your project, I'm getting less money from you than anybody else? It's just an awkward situation, and you wouldn't want to put me in that position. I want to give you the same services I give everybody else. Now, we're going to go through a bunch of fee structures that there's a way of accommodating for sort of um, value in a certain way, you know, whether there's an economy of scale, but in general, it's really, you just don't want to put yourself in a position where a client dictates your fee structure. So Julia, let's talk about sort of these different pricing models. And as you can see, there's quite a few up here because we see they exist almost in every, um, you know, client that we deal with. So the first one is a flat fee. Do you want to explain your thoughts on flat fee? I think the flat fee model is, is amazing. I think it can be really, um, really great and advantageous because it allows the client to understand expectations and a budget right out of the gate, right up front. Um, but at the same time, you could get into a lot of trouble if you're if you're constantly doing a flat fee model for a for the design fee aspect of the job if you're not tracking your time, because without the time tracking component, you actually don't know if you wound up ahead or behind on, on the flat fee um, type of structure. Flat fee it can be structured, I think, also in a number of different ways. It can just be a complete flat fee, $100,000, $150,000 as a design fee up front, paid over quarters or phases um, or even monthly, right? Again, that works really well for the client expectation. Um, but but I uh, the way I always have conversations with, with our firms and our clients is, well, how do you know that was the right flat fee to propose for this type of project? And sometimes the answer is, well, I have the data for that, right? I, I have all these previous jobs. I know how many hours I've spent in this type of design schematic um, phase before. Or sometimes the answer is, I, I, don't, I don't have a clue, right? I'm just, I'm just guessing. And yeah. um, we all know that that doesn't work well. And it's not sustainable in, in the long run um, because it doesn't give you the proper metrics. To, to fall back upon and, and move it forward. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing is, if you don't know the client, it's a really hard determination because, you know, like employees, you know, when a client hires you, you sort of have to get married instead of dating them. And it's, if you don't know their decision-making process, and I will tell you right now, any client that up that upfront says to you, I make quick decisions, either run away from them as fast as possible or know that they don't make quick decisions because someone's already told them that that's a problem. And therefore they, they're communicating that because 
they they're not good at it. And when someone doesn't make good decisions or quick decisions, it the project can drag on. And I had a client once that I think they had shown the client 30 beds and oh. they just couldn't make a decision at the end. And they eventually picked the first bed they ever saw. Um, but the amount of time and effort it takes to make a client to, to get a decision um, is going to eat up your fees if they if they drag on. And we always say you never, never give people more than three options um, because then they feel like they're the designer trying to make those decisions. And if you give them too many options, then they they wonder why they hired you. Um, but I think decision making is a big thing. And, you know, I always believe that you should interview your clients as much as they interview you, because it's all about, about making sure, you know, they're the right fit for your office. And if they're not, um, it, one client can really take a firm down um, when mm -hmm. and you're focused on that squeaky wheel all the time and you're missing the great opportunities that come your way. So the, the second one we have here is hourly. And, you know, I've always um, thought this a little bit only in that if it took you 20 years to come up with a detail, is it only worth an hour if you can draw that in an hour when it's something that is you've had great experience? And I don't think your billing rates could ever be high enough to accommodate the value of your knowledge. However, during I think during 08 and during the pandemic, people started shifting more to hourly because clients were uncomfortable with big fees. And you can't get hurt because you're getting paid for every hour of your time. But ultimately, is it really communicating your value when you're being paid hourly for something that you can generate very quickly? The other thing that um, with hourly that clients tend to ask for is not to exceed. And mm -hmm. I call it not to succeed because it's a lose-lose for you in that if you do hourly not to exceed and you don't spend as much as the budget, then you leave money on the table. And if you go over, you're not gonna get paid for it. So a client that says, I want it not to exceed, I'd rather you shift it to a flat fee and say, okay, then this is, this is the number. I can live with that number. And then if I'm really efficient, I can make more money off of it, but I'm not gonna do hourly to a max. Julia, what are your, your thoughts on that as well? I think from a client standpoint, right? So from the end user client, um, it's hard. It's hard from a budget standpoint because, a, a, yes, a client is always going to say, okay, well, if you're hourly, well, how many hours do you think it's going to take? And if you're constantly in that back and forth with that client in that conversation, I do agree. At that point, it just makes sense to go fixed fee, estimate your hours, pad it 10, 15, 20% even to make sure that you're covering yourself. And then again, we just revert back to the to the flat fee. Um, I think clients, some, some clients are okay with hourly, but there is, I think more and more, um, people scrutinize, right. They scrutinize those bills to say, well, why did it take you this long? Why did it take you this long? I don't think that you should have been sourcing and, and, and charging me 3.5 hours. Um, and for some clients, I think it works well, maybe for some smaller jobs, particularly as well that, that, you know, you know, the client and you're comfortable with that relationship. Um, but, uh, uh I would be more of an advocate personally of a flat fee if you have the data for it right. and only if you have the data for it. Exactly. And I also think hourly, you're right, they get to pick it apart, but it also, mm -hmm. if you're really unknown as to what the scope of the project is, the, how the client makes decisions, you, you are a little safer to be able to do hourly because you're just learning something. The problem is I've seen some people do hourly in like early phases, like schematics, just to learn about the client, but then they convert it to either a flat fee at that point, or they do hourly during installation or construction, because again, a lot of unknowns, you get the pushback sometime from clients that say, well, you were able to do it hourly for this much. Why are your fees so much for the, the flat fee? And so it gets a little confusing and sort of convoluted with certain clients that way. Um, but I think it's just really making sure you really understand your client and know what sort of fee is going to work best for them. Well, and, and hopefully, I think you've touched upon this now a couple of times, reselections, hopefully the reselections are capped in your contract. Um, and whether you, you give somebody two reselections or three, uh, or maybe it depends on the area of, of the home that you're uh, that you're working on. Um, but that way that that's a non-negotiable in terms of either flat fee or hourly. Um, and I've seen a lot of combinations of the two for sure as well. Um, 
And a, a lot of times, I think that the combination can behoove, right, sort of behooves the client. Again, they have an expectation to say, okay, we'll, we're flat fee up to three reselections. If you're then still unhappy, I'll continue to work with you. But at that point, I'm going hourly and here are my hourly rates. Yeah. Although I've heard the pushback from that saying, well, what if I don't like the three things you've sent me? Why am I paying hourly to see more? Because you agreed to it in your contract. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so the next one we have is markup. And, you know, in my experience, I've seen sort of, I mean, I've seen everybody from go full retail, but also 35 seems to be the higher end of the markup. And then 30 to 25, depending upon sort of your status or the size of your office, um, but somewhere in the 30, 35% range. Now, one of the arguments that people will make is, why am I paying you so much more on top of the price of that item? Markup came from the place of that designers could buy from the trade at 50% off of retail. And therefore, if they were selling it back to you at 35%, you were still saving 15% off of retail. And that model worked. When the internet sort of became very prevalent, people were able to see pricing at a different level. And the markup became a little bit more sketchy in that there was a lot of price comparisons. We still believe that, you know, when you really look at what it costs to procure a project or procure an item, the markup at 30% or 35% really only leaves a, cer a certain margin for um, profit in that. And so, you know, we still encourage that as a way of making money because there's a certainly a lot of effort and work, as you probably all know, in getting something from proposal to purchase. I will say that I have um, dealt with clients that have asked for markups to be reduced at certain points. And the one thing that I've recommended in the past is if a single item costs more than say $50,000, then there's an economy of scale and you can lower your price. Or if you're buying an antique, um, just you know certain things. But I had a client recently that told me that at certain tiers, they lowered their markup. And so let's just say the first million dollars was going to be at 35%. And then anything over that was going to drop to 30 and everything after, you know, a million and a half was going to drop to 25. And that model doesn't really work because if you're buying that much product, it's still the same amount of work. And I think the model of finding a, an individual item at a certain price is a better one to do, but reducing your rate based upon the purchase, because we all know the clients lie about how much they're going to purchase. And so by building a model like that, you're really just setting your up, yourself up for failure. Julia, some of your thoughts on markup? I think really good, um, a, a really good revenue driver for, for, for really good markup is actually vendor relationships and sourcing. And back to what you were saying, so much of, yes, the, the, the landscape has changed in terms of how we buy and who we buy from. And all design firms have different discounts with different vendors. Some are, I think, really good at making sure they have stock and dealer pricing, making sure that they're sourcing resourcefully, and that they can continuously come in under retail and still make 30, 35%. I, I'm an, I, I push for, for all of our firms to be at 30, 35% and, and really try to make sure that the initial contract goes out at, 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 as such. If there's pushback then from the from their client, then it's a conversation to say, okay, well, you know, well, why, what are the hiccups? Is it budgetary, et cetera? Um, but if you have good sourcing relationships, the, the markup, you can save clients money in terms of buying less than retail and consistently make the 30, 35% that you need to make um, as well, which I think in terms of procurement is, hopefully, hopefully that, that percentage will actually cover the time invested. Because again, going sort of looping it back to time tracking, there's a huge time component. Um, even after COVID, and now I know the, the freight delays have gone down, but making sure that product goes from point A to point Z takes an incredibly enormous amount of time. And I think a really good way to communicate that to your client as, as to why you need the markup is to, to let them know. I'm the one ordering. I'm getting product from point A to point Z. I'm dealing with the receiver. I'm making sure the product isn't damaged. If it is damaged, I'm the one going going back to the vendor, et cetera. I think a lot of times the the, the end client has doesn't understand that. 
they don't actually know all of the time and energy that goes in into it. And if they did, um, they would understand why there is a, right there is a markup and why it's necessary. Because I actually think that yes, the goal is to make money, but as a firm, you need to evaluate to make sure the percentage you're charging equates to the amount of hours spent um, for procuring that entire job. Yeah, completely. I mean, it's even why some people. Um, even if they buy retail, will uh, apply a markup because they still have to do all the work. Sure. Um, you know, it's it's just because uh, you're the client wants something particularly, and you, there's no discount at retail. You have to be paid for the effort you're putting into it. A lot of times, too. I mean, we've seen some clients get creative to say, okay, well, if you don't want me, for example, to deal with the receiving warehouse, then you receive you you do that, right? You receive the product. You go through all of those steps, and that and, and it's funny. We have there's clients who will agree to that, and then very quickly understand it's not as right. It's not as easy. Uh, I mean, it is worth the time and the dollars. And I actually think if your if your contract is worded in a way where you're able to express the time that goes into it, um, I really think it allows your their clients, your clients, the design firms' clients, to understand why the the markups markup exists. We need right. to be able to communicate that. To say this, okay. this, this is for, and this is why, right? This is why I'm compensated for this. Yes, completely. And you have to stand firm with it because Correct. as soon as you break down, you know they'll they'll see that ability to you know negotiate with you, and you really don't want that. Um, so you, the next one we have here is presented price, which many of you may not have heard or heard before or seen it in different language. What this means is typically a lot of designers customize their product. Sometimes they customize it because they want to basically make something a little bit different or it costs a little less, or they can they have vendors that they can make something a little bit less expensive for the client. But typically it's when things are originally designed. And when you, if you just charge based upon the cost of goods, meaning if it's a sofa and the fabric costs X and the frame costs Y, and I've designed it and I'm only giving you the cost of each of those uh, those raw items and then marking it up, you're not getting paid for the fact that you're giving somebody an original piece of artwork. And so we, we believe that at that point, if you're going to customize something for somebody, you should be able to set the price. And so what presented price means is this sofa is going to cost $10,000. Now, if you don't like it, we can go shop it and find the, a different one. But if you want something that we're designing, here's our price. And you stick with it. And um, and some people even mark up on top of their presented price. But I, I would simply say, just give them a price and charge it and build your markup into it. And if they choose to go with it, then you're going to make a little more money and you're going to be paid for the value of that being a unique item. So Julie, you, you, you've you seen this language and you've uh, any thoughts there as well? So I love your verbiage, by the way. That's not how I we've typically seen it, but I think it's a it's a really great way to to summarize it and include it in a contract. Um, and and yes, anything that is a hundred percent customized by the firm, drawn from beginning to end, whether it be upholstery or case goods, and, and then manufactured, and, and you're putting all of those different pieces together for that specific piece. Um, I would also agree with you. Yes, that. There is not necessarily, there's no set markup, right? And it's really just the prices. This is the price if you'd like this custom piece. Um, if someone is looking for a, a, a goal, I think it's, I usually see 50, 55, 60% as the markup if you take the, the cost of the product and then the selling cost. Um, mm -hmm. And I do think there's more wiggle room in upholstery than case goods because just the product cost is more expensive. But I think it is a really great way. If you're a firm who consistently does custom pieces, it, it, it's an incredible way to increase your revenue um, and make sure that it's a great revenue stream for you, uh, yeah. whether you're in upholstery or, or case goods. So if you are, and that actually could sometimes, you, you there could be more of a negotiation potentially in terms of your markup on other products, because you can then afford maybe a 30% markup or a 27% markup, because you know that you're still going to make X amount of dollars in total product margin. Right. Yeah, I remember doing this for a client probably 20 years ago. And within a year or two, you know, his, his numbers increased significantly because he was sort of giving it away. Mm -hmm. And they became very profitable because they it was beautiful product, a very well-known designer, and they weren't being paid for their value. 
And this was a way to do that. Uh, the next one we have is price per square foot, which is simply what it means, which is that if a client wants a budget and they're building a five or 10,000 square foot house, you think that the, the work that you're going to do to design that house is going to be based upon whether it's $100 a square foot or $50 a square foot, or 150 depending upon the scope of work. Um, if you're doing like all the interior finishes and actually drawings of millwork and all of that, um, or tile layouts or floor patterns, all of that can be based on the square footage. And, it, you know, I think in different regions, it varies quite a bit. Um, the thing that it does allow for is that if a project scope increases, then your fees automatically increase. So if the if you're working, say, with an architect and the house started out at, say, 7,500 square feet, and by the time the client said yes to everything, it was 10,000, your fee is going to incrementally increase. And therefore, um, the client understands that, everyone understands it, and it's not a hard negotiation. Um, it only gets tricky if you don't understand the scope of the project and the price per square foot is a hard thing to determine if you have never used it before. Julia, do you Almost. use this or see it a lot? So in our firms that are construction and architecture, I think actually quite a bit. Um, yeah. Again, all goes back to time tracking though, right? It only works if you have a frame of reference and if you understand what the hours associated will, will be. Um, I, I'm an advocate of the price per square foot model. If again, if you, if you have the metrics to, to back it up, I think it makes it very transparent for the client. There's a budget, um, there's a there's a process, and it and there's no there's almost no questions to be asked, and there's no time to be scrutinized. Right. Yeah. Um, and then lastly, we have retainer, and the only reason to put that there is basically it's about making a commitment. So by asking a client to make a retainer or to um, it means that they're committing to your project. And typically we say it's a non-refundable retainer. So if they, you know, kill the project after six months, it's very expensive for you to move your team to another project or bring in that next project that they were on. That's why we tell you to make it um, non-refundable. And we've had cases where we've had pretty significant retainers for very large projects, just because again, if it, if the project stopped, it's, it's going to take you a while to move your team. And in one case, it was a very significant project. And by allowing that, the client came back and said, no, 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 we really want the money back. And they said, well, you know, it's non-refundable, but however, if the project comes back online, we will credit that retainer back um, so that you don't have to have a new retainer. Um, but it's a security for you to know, especially if it's, it, go, it can go against your last bills so that you know you're going to get paid on those final invoices. And we all know at the end of a project, clients get fatigue on paying their bills. And so if you have a retainer, you know you can always credit that retainer. And as I said, it's about a commitment and the ability for a client to show you that they, they understand um, that you're going to hold their money until you make sure their payments are um, are accurate and on time. And if a client is really bad at making payments, you can apply that retainer and then just say, until it's replenished, we're not going to start work again. Again, it's a security measure. Do you agree with that, Julia? Yes. And I think we, I've seen two both non-refundable and refundable retainers. Refundable meaning not refundable to the end, not refundable back, but yes, applied to, applied to, to. Uh, yes, applied to, to, to future billing um, until you see obviously payment history. And then there are sometimes sometimes firms that will take smaller, I would say, completely non-refundable retainer, meaning we're keeping this, um, we're we're keeping a twenty five hundred five thousand dollar retainer on to work with you on your project, and it, it just convert to design fees at the end. But that doesn't work, obviously, for for larger scale construction type and architecture type jobs. Those yeah. larger retainers usually are applied to um, the the last bill. Yes, which makes sense. Um, so I think um, moving on to just some things about structuring your contract, these are just some simple points. Um, but we, we really feel like, again, a contract is really to set expectations. And it's really to make sure that you put things in your contract that really protect you. Um, you know, for instance, you want to have this, if you want to be able to publish the project, 
uh, it's important that you bring that right up front to the client. There's a lot of clients today that make you sign NDAs or they don't want the project published. And it's really a, a hardship because you work so hard on your projects. You want to have that exposure. And if they're not going to let you publish it, you need to know that right up front. Um, and also in this day and age of Instagram, you don't want to get in trouble or, you know, someone post a picture and then the client. I mean, I had a client once that he said, look, you can have the project published, but there's to be no mention of the family. And when they shot a picture of the bedroom, there was a family portrait on the nightstand and that got published and they went ballistic. So you just have to be very careful about how clients think about that. One of the other things that we always try to add, and this came out of a significant potential lawsuit from a client who bought an antique and when this was actually during the downturn in the economy. They needed to sell a very expensive rug, and they found out the antique they bought wasn't authentic, and therefore um, the client was very upset that they they couldn't even sell it for what they paid for it. So we always say that you the authenticity authenticity of the um, of the antique needs to be at the responsibility of your client. They need to. Um, hire somebody if they're going to buy something very expensive to make sure it's authenticated. Um, and then, you know, sales tax, making sure that um, the client understands that all the uh, things that you purchase for them, you're passing along with sales tax. Um, Julia, what else? Shipping, freight, um, storage. Um, I recently learned also just in a, a almost legal issue where it was recommended that a budget not go into the contract directly and any type of budgetary um, uh, communication be outside the contract in an email potentially because certain states will hold budgets um, as part of the contract, regardless of if the if the contract says, well, th this is an estimate and can be within budget. So um, that was it does vary per state, but it was very interesting for me to learn that any type of document like that should not be included in the original contract, communicated differently. I'm a big advocate, obviously, on the accounting side to make sure you're covering yourself with the correct verbiage for sales tax and use tax in your contract, especially after um, Wayfair sued South Dakota the sales tax um, landscape has, has changed drastically. And so those processes are becoming, I think, more and, and more strict or stricter, excuse me. And so make sure that, again, the firm is covering their end and, and being really transparent to clients. Um, I actually, I don't like to see freight called out separately in contracts because from, a, from an accounting standpoint, it allows us to make more money in terms of markup. So if there's any way, unless a client asks, uh, I don't, again, I, I don't like to call that out as a separate mm -hmm. line. Um, also to, again, going back to, to, to budgets a bit more, depending on how you present that to make sure that, again, it, it's a completely separate part of after the contract is signed, then you go into potentially a, a budget negotiation and, and budget documentation, but keep all of that information um, not within the actual contract itself. And I've, and I've always been an advocate of when you begin a project that you sit down with the client, you go over the contract, you set these expectations and you tell them how you're going to work. So for instance, we say, clarify how you're expecting to receive payments. You could bring your bookkeeper into the conversation with the client and simply say, uh, you know, this is, this is what our invoice looks like. This is what we expect from you. This is how we want to be paid. And so that right up front, they know the exact process they can expect from you. And therefore, there's no surprise. The worst thing you can ever do is send an invoice to a client and they're shocked or they're surprised. Because we all know if we get a bill that we don't recognize, we put it aside and figure out, oh, look, I'll deal with that later. That's what you don't want to happen. You want to make sure that you're going to get paid as quickly as possible because the expectations are met. So that sort of leads us to ways of accepting payments. And in a few minutes, we're going to ask Colin to come in and just talk about why we were, thought it was so important uh, to create this uh, studio pay initiative uh, that allows for payments. So right now, you know, the, the ways you can pay clients in ACH, basically a wire transfer or just a, a bank transfer, and then obviously online credit cards. 
you have probably heard from many vendors that they're getting a little bit sick and tired of the credit card fees that are out there. Um, and if you really think about it, one piece of furniture can be hit as much as 6% if the client is paying you for that item to be purchased and you accept a credit card, they're going to get hit with a credit card fee or you are. And then when you pay the vendor with a credit card, they're getting hit with another fee. And so for that same item, it's getting double dipped. And we are looking at different solutions at Studio to see if we can arbitrage that in some way that we don't have multiple fees. And certainly to get to an ACH model or wire model where it's like a $10 fee is a lot less than paying three or 6% um, on top of all the credit card fees and everything else. So it's something we're exploring quite a bit. And uh, Colin, I'm going to let you sort of jump in here and just talk about Studio Pay at this point. Great. Um, thank you for having me today. And uh, yeah, definitely happy to talk about the benefits of Studio Pay. Um, I believe this one line here, a payment solution built for interior designers, sums up a lot in that um, Studio Designer had partied with other um, third party payment processors. But um, we realized that in them catering for the masses, sometimes that didn't work necessarily as, as well for the designer. So we wanted to create the better alternative. Um, things like high, very high flexible limits. We understand in the design industry, um, it can be very routine for large payments collected week to week. And you need those to consistently go through to keep your projects on time and send out your orders. Um, so uh, definitely high flexible limits, low competitive fees, and it's really easy to set up your customers. Uh, for ACH credit card or both options. Uh, another great thing about Studio Pay being fully integrated with the Studio Designer platform, it's really easy as sometimes as simple as three clicks to post your payment. So you're just keeping things on track with your general ledger. And again, getting those orders out uh, really timely. Gross settlement, we make sure that the amount that hits your bank account is the entire amount of the payment, not a net amount minus the fee. It just helps with reconciliation that much quicker. The fee will be listed separately. And there's definitely more to come. Studio Pay is our baby, and we want to continue to make it the best experience uh, designers can have, of course. And um, it's really great to just have your one support team uh, to help you uh, when it comes to uh, all aspects of running your business, integrated payments, accounting, and uh, project management um, with Studio Pay. That just uh, ensures you have everything working together for uh, smoother business operations. And uh, Julia, I know you have uh, some experience working with clients utilizing Studio Pay right now. It'd be great if you could, uh, you know, tell us some some about how they're enjoying Studio Pay so far. It's definitely been a, a great process from, I think, from start to finish. Um, and I really like the Studio Pay portal, much more user-friendly than the Stripe portal, personally. Um, and in terms of the integrated payment posting, it, there is, and I don't know, you know obviously, who on, on, on the Zoom today is familiar with it, but there is a, an, an additional drop-down under your accounting section where, where you will be able to see the payments coming in in real time. Meaning, um, so instead of having four different screens open, so it, you would have to have Stripe open, you'd have to have your bank account open, and you'd have to have, so three screens, Studio open, to understand what's been paid. In this particular scenario, yes, you'd only have to have the one accounting screen open in within Studio Designer. You'd be able to see who paid, what they paid, and how, meaning exactly where, what did they pay in terms of um, the invoice or proposal, item by item by item. So that does make it very, very easy. As we all know these days, wire fraud is extremely, extremely prevalent. I mean, I'm sure we all have horror stories. I personally have some great ones. And um, this is really allowing us to make sure that the payments are secure. The charge is even much cheaper than a traditional wire fee, which is usually $35 for both the person initiating and the person receiving it, as opposed to the studio pay ACH option is $10. And you do have the option consistently always for current clients and new clients to toggle between, between credit cards and ACHs. And we, again, always recommend, even going back to the contract that Keith was talking about, that's a conversation with the client to understand how do they want to pay? How can they pay by using Studio Pay? What does the link look like? What does that process look like? But really from start to end, it has been very, very, very um, seamless. It's been great. Excellent, all right. Um, 
So now, yeah, I'd like to, I'm going to share screen and just kind of give a, a little sneak uh, preview here at uh, how easy it is to use Studio Pay. Um, starting here at the uh, Studio Designer dashboard, it's really easy to set up your clients, whether for ACH, credit card, or both. You can set up their default options. But in time to send to a client, we can go to Projects, Proposals. I've got my test client here. I've got a proposal ready to go. Um, whatever default settings they have, um, every document will have this um, custom option here, where if the case was that they were set up um, by default for ACH, but we're going to allow a credit card this one time, you can just simply click to customize and maybe require full payment and save. And now this document alone will be updated with these settings. And as long as we're publicly uh, visible here and we have an amount due, we can send to our client. We have our uh, different methods for sending interactive document, client portal, or emailing a PDF. The pay now link for Studio Pay will work the same for all three options, whatever your preference. Um, for the sake of a demo today, I'm going to go to email a PDF here. And whether or not you want to save as a PDF and send through your own separate email or through the system, the pay now link works also just fine. I'm just going to do that. Colin, and actually, can I can I piggyback? We get the question a lot of, do, sure. does the client need to have the portal set up, the client portal? And the answer to that is no. That interactive link will show up regardless. Um, that seems yeah. to be a, a common question for new for new users or people considering it. They're like, I don't want the client to have the client portal or the client doesn't want to set up the client portal. And they automatically assume that that pay now link will not work for them. Great. Uh, yeah, thank you for bringing that up then. Um, yes, the, the, the pay now link works, emailing a PDF, interactive document or client portal. Uh, it all works just the same. Client portal just comes with its own kind of other uh, benefits for the client experience. Um, so when your uh, client receives the document here, they can just you know take a look and if everything checks out, of course, click the pay now link, scroll down and they will have their options. Just kind of go through these real quick, credit card, pretty much what you come to expect. Put in your name, the card info, doesn't need an address. It'll highlight accordingly to the card info here. Ch check to agree and then pay now. And ACH option, uh, really simple, just name, is uh, account type, routing, counting number, just need to confirm it, check to authorize, and pay now. And real great thing uh, with Studio Pay is that um, within seconds, uh, a green band will go across the top, uh, quickly informing your client that their payment has gone through successful. Um, we'd learned that other processors, sometimes it's a little confusing, like something would swirl for quite a while, and then they'd later get a, an email notification. But right away, a green band will show that a payment has gone through. Not only that, but I'm gonna show you here uh, what it looks like in the client portal. Right after making a payment, they will see a transaction ID, date, and amount. So it's very clear to the client. Job well done, uh, payment's been made. And with the client portal, there's some other great things. You can have, as you see here, have a saved payment method option. Um, if everything looks good with the document, I can just go, okay, ready to pay. And here's my saved payment method, credit card, and click pay now, and they're done which is great, especially if they have a few documents to look at. And there are, uh, it's really easy to set up various uh, email notifications to know uh, when a client has made a, a payment or um, other parts of the payment processing. Um, but real great feature of this being uh, fully integrated is now um, once they've received a notification that a payment's been made, they can go to accounting, payment posting, and this is what Julia was referring to earlier. As you can see, uh, here's a logged list of uh, client payments that have been made. And uh, it's pretty quick uh, when you can be able to choose the uh, transaction right there. And as you can see, the system already recognizes the proposal or invoice number it's attached to, the client's address ID, uh, who sent it. Um, you can add to the default description here, but the real great thing is, is um, if every all the information checks out, and here's a proposal, all you need to do is apply deposit to all, post payment, and then click yes to confirm. And like that, in just three clicks, your payment is posted and you can move on with your other operations, getting those orders ready or whatnot. You do have some other options uh, here on how you want the money to be distributed, but for the most part, it's really as quick and easy as seeing the payment's been made, and then a few clicks away to posting and 
that's that. And that uh, more or less really kind of sums up kind of just a little quick uh, sneak preview here today um, on how easy it is to be uh, using Studio Pay um, as uh, your client payments tool for online payments. Thanks, Colin. It's it's really a very beneficial tool, and we're really excited about the opportunity with it. I know that we only have a few minutes left, but I understand we have a lot of questions. Uh, yeah. So we open this up, Sam, if you have questions for us. Absolutely. So I'm also going to, I have a um, question for the group as well here. What I'll launch and put that up, but we'll get into our first question. Um, Keith and Julia, we had a lot of questions when it came to the pricing. Um, one in particular that was like a common thing is what are you, what are your guys' insight and suggestion on sticking to, to one pricing model or doing like a combination of like flat fee and hourly? I mean, I don't know, Julie, you want to take that one? Sure. Um, I mean, I think I had mentioned it. I'm an advocate of working with the client to come up with a contract that makes the client happy where you are absolutely certain you are still compensated for your time. So if you have a client that says to you, I want to be paid hourly, that's great. Then make sure that you're structuring your hourly fees uh, accordingly. If you have a client who says, I want to make sure that you're a flat fee and you don't go above and, you know, you don't go above X and this is the only way I'll work with you. As long as, again, you can be compensated accordingly for your time, then I think it's okay to be flexible um, on, on both markup and, and flat uh, and hourly or flat fee. So, so we have some firms even who will charge a, a really expensive markup. They'll be 50, 60, 70% and they'll have a really low flat fee because a client in that particular scenario wanted that type of model. So if we're compensated and we're making the money we need to make on that project to cover our direct and indirect expenses, why not work with that type of client? Great. I think the the trick is consistency so that, you know, again, you're being fair to all your clients. Um, but I, I think that I agree with Julia creating a model that allows for the best outcome for both you and the client, as long as you're not compromising your your fee, your fee structure. Great. Another question on pricing. Do you suggest full transparency with markup percentage? Absolutely. Great. Okay. I assume Drew, you agree with that or no? <laughs> Um, I, I think in 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 most scenarios, um, I, not necessarily in the custom pricing, right? I mean, I think that verbiage needs to stay for anything that's a custom piece. Right. The price is the price. Um, but I think yes, there 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 should be. I actually think for for like record keeping and project management, that's typically the easiest way as well to say uh, we'll give you the best price that we can get, and here's our markup. Um, and to really make sure that the, their clients understand that we, we really are trying to make sure that our, our vendor relationships are where they need to be to make sure that my net pricing is where it needs to be as well. Yeah. And the only caveat I'd give to that is if you're somebody who has inventory and you, you shop a lot and you think that one day you're going to sell something to somebody, put that item into your inventory and be able to sell it at whatever price you, you choose, because at that point, you're buying it not for the client, but for your own eye. And therefore, you may get it. I remember a client once finding a painting that was signed by an artist with a whole description about the South of France and where it was painted. And she bought it for $500 and was able to sell it for $5,000 because it was actually worth that. But because she found it in the back of a warehouse in a little village in, the, in France, I don't think you need to be transparent there. I think she, yes, if she had bought that for a client, she needed to be, but she bought it for herself to sell one day. So when it comes out of your own inventory, as long as the client understands your pricing, that it's my inventory and I'm going to sell it to you at this price. Again, it's being transparent about, about how you do that. Um, but other than that, if you're buying from vendors, 100% it'll come back and bite you if you don't, if you're not transparent. Great. Another one came in, how do you handle project pauses and restart fees? They said, I request a 20 to 30% fee for a restart after three months based on a fixed fee. It's a hard one to answer, right? Like what are the circumstances of that particular situation? So was the fixed fee, were the months exceeded for the fixed fee? Was the fixed fee for a certain period of time? What was, 
what right, what caused the fee to have the restart? I think it, it, I think it really all de depends. Um, hourly, I think should be straightforward. Um, in terms of fixed fee, we've typically seen if, if there's a fixed fee and it extends six months, 12 months, 18 months, and there is a pause, then that fixed fee does stop because the hours stop. That's the expectation. If the, if the job goes on pause, there's no more hours worked. I don't need to charge you the fixed fee. And then once the project resumes, the fixed fee resumes, and really the fixed fee then extends the length of the, the original contract. So I guess if a project goes on hold, um, when you're anticipating keeping your staff busy, and if it's any more than three months, there is that startup fee where you have to get re-engaged and take people off another project. And so I, I do think, I don't know whether those percentages work or not. I'd say that there should be a fee if a project is going to cause you, you know, significant pain in getting it restarted. If a client just simply says, I'm going on vacation for three months, don't do another thing. And you've got your staff sitting there. Usually it takes about a month to get people re-engaged. So I would say, you know, look at what your costs are for the people on that project for about a four week period. And somewhere around that is probably an accurate number to create, whether it's a percentage or a flat fee of what it's going to cost you to re-engage. Great. Um, another question, is 100% prepayment from the client the industry standard for design materials? I don't think so. Um, I think that we typically see it for fabric and you know anything custom, um, but usually you have to make a deposit of 50% on quite a bit of goods. A lot of people will charge like 75% so that their fees are certainly covered if, if something goes south with the project um, in that deposit. But I don't think 100% across the board. Julia, do you see that that often? Um, I, uh, I I think it's still very mixed. I, I think it saves administratively, right? If you're able to collect 100%, um, it could save you some time. Um, you also have some clients that will push back on that to say, but your the lead time is 24 weeks. I don't want to pay you 100%. So that may not even be an option in all scenarios. I do think if you were if you're specifying a, a, a completely from RH um, and there are short lead times, then 100% is okay. Like you were saying, fabric re requires it. But I think in um, in anything that's labor related, uh, you know, millwork things like that, 50% is definitely also still the, the standard. So it, 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 it's, I would say it's fairly mixed, 50-50. You know, and we, we also had some pushback again when the economy fell because people were saying, well, how do I know if that vendor is going to be around? And, you know, as much as you, and we'd say, oh, they've been around for, you know, 20 years. And I go, yeah, so was Lehman Brothers. So it's like, you know, I think when people feel uncomfortable about the economy giving a big deposit, so I, I think it's a case-by-case -case basis. Um, but in general, there's probably, it's probably not a hundred percent all the time, but look, if you can always get a hundred percent and you're managing the client's money, go for it. And, and to getting a retainer, right? So you could separate and apart from doing anything retainer based for the design fees, taking a retainer for purchasing could really speed up a project as well. Um, and that's a really great way to present it to the client to say, I'll, I'll, I will, I'll manage all these funds. I'll let you know as as we're purchasing product, I'll, I'll be very transparent, right? The communication needs to be good, but then it does allow you to have a little bit more control of the money. And again, make sure that you're not being held up by client payments. Yeah, for sure. Right. And well, that, you know, that was especially important when the pandemic hit, where if you didn't get a, and we saw the, and, and through studio, because we collect a lot of data, we saw that people, the, the lead time between getting a proposal out and purchasing, uh, became much shorter because if you didn't get it out, the ba the backlog of product and the supply chain was so horrible that it had to go out immediately. It slowed down a little bit now, but people were like getting invoices out or, or payments out within five days, where in the past it could have been as much as 30. Right. Well, we are at the hour mark. Julia, Keith, Colin, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Have a great rest of your day. Yeah, thank you, everybody. We really appreciate it. And uh, we hope that we continue to serve you as, in the best way we can. Thank you, Julian, Colin, and Sam. Thank you. Thank you.